So I want to tell you about an experiment I ran recently at a local sandwich shop. Here's how it went. I got dressed up as a panda and I walked in to place an order. But to my surprise, not a single employee said a word about my costume that I was wearing. Instead, I was greeted by three people who were smiling and saying hello. And one person stepped forward and asked me if I was ready to order. Pretty uneventful, which makes for a boring experiment, but actually says a lot about the employees who make everyone and anyone who walks in feel comfortable and right at home, which is what we're focusing on today, building rapport and how to make customers and employees comfortable. Here with me today is one of the owners of that sandwich shop, Grant Strayer. Grant, welcome to the show, my man. Thank you, Travis. It's really good to be here. So are you at all surprised by my experiment and how your staff treated me? No, you texted me that day before lunch. I was like, what shop are you going to be at? This and that. He's like, I was like, I don't know if it's going to go the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> it's just, it, it's going to work out though. <laughs> so I have a clip of their reaction. I want to show you, like I said, it's not too eventful, but I feel like you'll enjoy it. Let's take a look at it now. All right, I'm here at Gateway Subs. Hello, hello. How's it going, man? Good. I am ordering. And Chet's wearing the chef hat, so it's not even. You're not. You're not facing him. I'm gonna do a coffee for now, and I'm gonna wait for my friend. Alrighty. <laughs> didn't say anything. He had a. Uh, his friend made him that yeah, hat, and like the amount of customers that comment yeah. on the hat, totally it's normal. pretty oh, funny. Oh, totally normal. Well, I have Grant coming onto my podcast, and my company is a panda. So I asked the guy behind the, ca the cash register, I was like, you going to say anything about my panda suit? He's like, no, not yet. <laughs> and then we don't have to watch the rest of it, so it's a little bit long. But he was just like, I really like it. Where, where can I get one? And I was like, Amazon. And he's like, okay, cool. And then he asked me to like do a twirl so he could s see the tail, <laughs> the little puff ball of a tail on the back that I didn't realize until like 20 minutes after you ate your lunch. So what's your reaction? Like your staff sees it all or what? Oh, yeah. And the nice like we're a sandwich shop. Like at the end of the day, you could have the wealthiest man in town in line behind the poorest man in town. And they're both coming to get the same good quality hoagie. And so we see a little bit of everything in between. You know, like the, when there's festivals going on downtown, we're a little bit off the beaten path. However, people do come for sandwiches and, and whatnot. And, and we've seen far crazier than what looks like a comfortable pajama. I can tell you, if I feel like if I walked into like like I don't know, an Office Depot, someone would be like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, it's like, you know, am I getting pranked here? <laughs> What's going on? Are you making a TikTok? Like, yes. All right, let's start off our show. Section one: creating good vibe environments for customers. I took it upon myself to go look up your business on Google My Business, take a look at some of the reviews. And I downloaded the first or the most recent like 40 or so reviews. Uh, you actually have like, I think over 120 on there, which is, yeah. you've only been open for like, like a little over a year. Yeah. We got about 200 it's crazy. and 25 star reviews, a couple fours and you know, yeah. a couple threes. We're at a 4.9 rating on Google and a five star rating on Yelp with 70 uh, reviews on Yelp. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay. I think it might be a fun exercise. I don't know if Grant and his team have done this yet, but like, let's do a word cloud of, I gathered all the text from like those 40 reviews mm -hmm. and then threw it into a word cloud generator. And let's take a look at it now. I took out a lot of the words that were just in there, like review and like response. Um, but a couple that stood out to me here is just great, local, fresh, friendly, best, delicious, amazing. Kyle. It Italian uh. chips. And then Kyle. <laughs> So there were like eight guys named Kyle that reviewed your restaurant and that apparently me up. Kyle's loves sandwiches. Until you put this up here, I would have never <laughs> been able to tell you what the, the most common customer's name is. <laughs> now but, you, but now I can. Now you know. Um, is there anything here that surprises you, or is this kind of like reinforcing what you are doubling down on as like a brand and as a restaurant? Yeah, so I think this is I appreciate you doing this because I think it's really cool. Um, just to be able to see it all in a cloud, we get to go through the five or the not just the five stars, but all the re reviews when they come in. 
And uh, I get to look at them real quick, and it, it always makes my heart jump a little bit when I see that Google review. I'm like, oh, hopefully it's good, and then it is, and, and 99% of the time it is. And if it's not, like we'll go above and beyond to make it right. Um, but no, it just kind of reinforces what we're trying to do uh, best, the local feel um, that we're providing. Fresh is a big one on there. Obviously, lunch, because we're, we're a sandwich spot. We do do breakfast and dinner as well. We roast our own coffee and whatnot. Um, but no, we, we, we try to, every single customer that comes in, we try to give them a greeting, you know, say hello, welcome them into our space. Um, everything about the shop was designed to bring that community feel to it. Society's never been closer yet. We never felt farther apart, especially over the past three years. Yeah. And this mission was kind of to do that. You know, the first person, first way to get to someone's mind or their soul is to feed them physically first. Um, and that's what we get to do. You know, we get to give a smile, take them down the line. They get to see their masterpiece being built. We do think that we're the professionals. However, if there's any modifications or anything that, you know, they want to spruce it up. We can definitely accommodate. Um, and then we wrap it up carefully, put a nice little piece of tape on it, ask you whether you want a bag or not, and then send you on to the register or on your way. Yeah. And I think watching that video of your staff and then seeing the word staff here, mm-hmm. there's definitely, you know, something to be said about how well you're hiring and training your folks. We'll get into that. We're going to pull up an image of a text message from a friend who introduced me to you. And I asked him, what do you love about Gateway Subs? And he wrote, not only is it a quality hoagie made with precision, I love that all my toppings get tucked in nicely for the perfect bite every time, but it feels like family when you walk in. And that's what really stood out to me. That was the precipice for this episode and interviewing Grant. Everyone welcomes you. There's good energy, good vibes all around. It feels like you're catching up with old friends, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time in. What do you think of that? Um... One, I think that Nick is very well spoken. That was, that was well done. And yeah, that's, I mean, on the wall when you're leaving, it says come as a customer, leave as a family member. You know, and that's every time someone comes in for the first time, they get a free bag of chips. We crush it up on the sandwich. We try to give before we ever ask to get. Um, when we were doing our own cookies, anytime a kid came in and gave us a high five, they got a free cookie. Dogs get a free slice of turkey when they come in with their owner. And like, it just kind of, yeah, we, we we're able to make it whatever we want, you know, and, and it's me and three other partners and, and well, three other co-owners and, uh, you know, we, we run the ship. Yeah. So if we want to make today a free cookie day for kids, we're allowed to make today a free cookie day for kids. If we want to pretty much do anything, we don't say no. We help out to the community as much as possible. Our marketing budget is pretty much giving away free sandwiches to people who ask and then trying to figure out a way to set up tables, interact, like get more involved. Um, so yeah, I think you hit it on the head. We do get to know a lot of our regulars. The craziest stories was like the first week we opened, someone came seven times in seven days. <laughs> and like, you know, three times in 24 hours was another crazy one, like dinner at night, breakfast in the morning, dinner in the evening. And um, <laughs> And it's cool. Like we, we have one customer that spends three months, four months in the summer up in Michigan and he pulled up the other day and just like, you know, four months just boom. Hey, how you doing? Welcome back. You getting your latte? And he's like, yep. And I was like, sweet. Didn't skip a beat. And uh, one of the aspects of starting this whole thing was yeah, like I get to go places and make the town feel really small. Like I go out now in St. Pete and I see some of my customers um, I get to see some of my customers at Publix, like, and then it just it creates, it makes it feel like home. What factors are most responsible for creating a good vibe environment? A bajillion. <laughs> what right. are some that stick out to you? Um, so from the onset, we started it where like the first person you speak to is a slicer. The slicer greets you with a, a smile and then also gives you a little walkthrough if you've never been in before. Mm-hmm. We did white walls and tall ceilings because the white walls bring in clarity. This uh, blue is our logo and that's like the color of the sky. So then therefore the, like sky represents with happiness rather than some of these other colors like yellow and red. Yes, it makes you hungry, but it also makes you angry. You know, so then you get taken down the line and our motto is whatever makes you happy makes us happy. We give you the free chips. So we're already giving a little blessing before you even get to the checkout. And um, and then we just make your experience fun. Like in a day we're making sandwiches and like all four of us owners 
we all have college degrees. We're all going to go into the corporate route. We're all going to go do this, you know, other life that we were going to live. And, and we kind of decided to tra- trade the paycheck for the happiness paycheck. And then, you know, hopefully we keep doing our job right. We keep building the brand. We keep doing the little things and, and building blocks and keep bringing on cheerleaders that give us the five stars, that go and tell their friends, that love to see young individuals just grinding. And, you know, hopefully there's a paycheck there too. You know, and they say, like, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And, like, what I particularly love isn't necessarily sandwiches, but it's a human interaction. You know, like, people who come in slouched over, angry, like, whatever, and then by the time they're checking out, we're, like, high-fiving them, having a good time, and and they get to leave feeling a little bit better, and they don't even know why they're feeling better. (laughs) Talk to me about how you're hiring employees what are you looking for at a sandwich shop and um, a cafe and all the other things that you're doing as well that would translate to like any customer facing role? Yeah. So like I said, like we're all college educated individuals. And when planning this out, 80% of business is the same, 20% is different. And that's where passion can come into play. But at the base root of any sing- any business, it's dealing with customers, dealing with employees, learning how to produce a product consistently and get it out the door on an efficient schedule and then like closing the loop and having customers come back, right? And through this playground of Gateway, we kind of have built those things in where we have individuals who've came to us and maybe they don't have the best soft skills and communication skills. And just by being around us and working with us, and obviously we're a very young company and we're, we do everything wrong, the first time and then we try to get a little bit better, get a little bit better. Um, But it just helps bring out confidence. This is their show. Like a customer doesn't know you make a mistake unless you let them know you made a mistake and things like that. And then also just being a professional and getting into that groove. Um, One of the things we're looking for when hiring is like, uh, are you coachable? And are you like willing to do everything? Because in the end of the day, like we hire one employee like essence, right? We're not hiring back of house, front of house, all like it's just one, yeah. right? Like you're a gateway sandwich slinger. And at the end of the day, you got to be able to make sandwiches. You got to be able to do coffee. You got to be able to wash dishes, run trash, you know, sweep things up when they break and uh, clean tables and then give a smile to every single customer. And if you can do those few things and everything else can be like worked in from there. But the, the, biggest onset is, are you willing to be coached? And do you have a good attitude? And do you care about customer service? Because everything else, those are skill sets. And like, yes, soft skills is a skill set. But if the person's not first open to the idea of being exposed and learning, then they'll never be able to get everything else. And so like typically when we do interviews and things, I'll have our managers interview first, or we'll have assistant managers, then the managers, and then I'll sit down with them as kind of like, the cultural, uh, like cultural guider, you know, like, like that's what I care about. Like they're talking about, can you do the job? Can you do this and this? And I sit down, I'm like, Hey, you're coming into my family yeah. and this is my family. And I don't know what you would do for yours, but I would do just about anything for mine. So if it turns out into a situation, you know, I only want to work in win wins, but if this doesn't work out, that's okay, and we'll like go our separate ways. But this is what we have to offer. This is what it, we expect out of you, as far as like how you treat our customers, how you treat our fellow individuals, um, and everything else. I like that. What about this chips technique? Tell me about like <laughs> you've mentioned it a couple times, and it sounds like you do this for first time customers. Where'd you get this idea? What are you hoping to achieve with it? Um. So back to like the origin story of gateway you know we had two of our uh co-owners or three of us in total is from boca raton florida where we grew up with this style of sandwich you know badass layer of meat on the bottom or you got your uh your mayo your your mustard things like that you got your meat you got your cheese you got all your veggies and then we put a layer of meat on the top to tuck it all in for bed so it's like you're eating a little sushi roll Mm -hmm. so that every bite should be consistent and true Mm. um and keeping with like that flavor profile. And then the sandwich shop that we grew up going to, like if you asked them, they would do it. It wasn't necessarily like an advertised thing. And we're like, that's genius. Like everyone as kids was like throwing chips on their subs individually, but like making sure their friends didn't see because it was a little <laughs> weird. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we took a vehicle that 
was driving pretty well and then added better rims to it. And um, that's what the chips are. Yeah, and it's something like I'm big texture eater. Even like while building this whole thing out, I lost my like taste buds for four months because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we were going through this and all I cared about was like the texture feeling of it. Like I couldn't even taste anything of it. Um, so the crunch with like everything else going on, just it's like croutons on a salad. <laughs> yeah, it just makes sense. Um, and yeah, so for the first time customers, we put it on for free and then afterwards you can add it to any sandwich. We do have a few sandwiches that are already built in with the chips. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, it just makes sense once you try it. Let's take a look at some of the photos. Um, I wanna better understand the layout of your restaurant. Talking about good vibes, I think a big part of it is your environment. You're a brick and mortar location. I know some people maybe listen to this. They only have a website, but I think there's a lot of stuff that makes sense for how you navigate a new customer. So this is the main wall as you walk in, and it says, for those that are just listening, we're looking at photos um, inside of Gateway Subs, and there is a mural that says, we are Epicureans who value good business and treat people like people. And then there's these gigantic oversized um, benches that I think you had custom made. Um, and then let's flip to the next picture here. And we're looking at, um, basically like the main sub making station. Like yeah, this is your, this is our kitchen. This is our, where the magic happens. This is where the menu is. This is where you order. Um, and then we got a big old local eats mural mm -hmm. that, uh, we had James Hartzell, who's a local muralist in town. He, he did a lot of this stuff for us and we were able to become friends with him just by, kind of praying and searching out for a good person that could help us out with these things. Um, and then let's flip to the next one. This is what you see when you first walk in. Um, you're greeted basically right up to the substation and you've got a nice kind of formation where a line can form. And let's flip to the last one. This is basically outdoor eating, a very welcoming kind of clean, open environment. But I'm curious about like some of the things you've learned through this first location about a good vibe environment, what didn't work, what did work. Tell me tell me some stories about it. Yeah, so the first photo, we're Epicurean to value good business and treat people like people. That's just stemming from like from the base layer, not necessarily in the whole... We're not Epicureans where we follow Epicurean. We're Epicureans in the essence that we enjoy good food and good taste, mm -hmm. right? And then for the people who value good business, is just we're, you know, we're trying to do an honest business. We're trying to do a good business. We're trying to pe treat people... We're trying to bring back the art of customer service to some extent because a lot of businesses have lost that. And uh, we went through such a tech age that it seems like human interaction has been left to the wayside for efficiency's sake. And I don't think that's necessarily where our future has to hold for us. I think it's a lost commodity. And then treating people like people and the extension of that is rather than objects getting in the way of our own happiness. And that's like our base layer. You know, every single person who's coming in they, just like us, go through trials and tribulations. They have problems. You don't know if that's their lowest of low days. You don't know if that's their highest of high day. You know, and if we're able to give them a smile on their lowest days and just like, hey, like, quick conversation, like, we have no idea what's, what, what the stories of our customers are. And uh, that's something that's extremely important to me. I ended up losing a brother about a year and a half ago, and that's some, like due to depression and suicide, and that's something that just is going to become a plight, you know, especially with what we've done as society over the past few years, we've separated each other, we've made enemies of one another and things like that. And like the world's a dark place right now. And uh, if we can give a smile and give a little bit of light to let someone take that with them, like it, it might be the difference between a, a permanent action and something that's not, you know, and that's the, the deepest of the, that's not, but that's like relatively, that's important. Absolutely. You yeah. Know? Thank you for sharing that with us and sorry to hear about your brother. And mm -hmm. I think that this is a, a great testament to like what you've built and how inspiring that can be. Um, yeah. The good vibes are, are imminent when you walk in. Yeah. And not to interrupt, but like every valley is a peak and every peak is a valley and every valley gives way to a greater or equivalent peak. Mm -hmm. If we so to like, so choose to walk that path and it's a, it's a dark path at times, but then it gets lighter and it's like, I just want to be able to treat every single person that comes in there with 
the way that I would want to be and, and I want to be friends with all my customers because I only want to sell to my friends. Yeah. Like, that makes life a lot easier too. Um, so that's what the, the mural and the wall and everything mm-hmm. and then the local eats, like, you know, we're a bunch of individuals who moved from Boca Raton, Indiana, all over and, and made St. Pete our home and St. Pete thankfully has just gave us a big hug and brought us in and, and it's been such a blessing for us to be able to do some of the things we've been able to do and uh, um, we want to make sure that all of our, as we continue to grow, you know, we're one year in, a year and a half at the first shop, we're three months in at the second shop, we're a young ambitious company, we do have plans to grow, we, we, that's our trajectory. And um, we want to make sure that every community that we go into mm-hmm. has that same local feel and we can adapt and help and just, you know, I want com- I want communities to be excited about us to move in. And South Pasadena was thrilled. The mayor showed up. The whole city council Dang. showed up for the grand opening. We had Mayor Christman, previous Mayor Christman, show up yeah. because he didn't get a sandwich on our year previous when he was <laughs> mayor of St. Pete. He yeah. had to run to an appointment. And uh, he showed up at our second grand opening without us even asking. And um, mm-hmm. that was really cool to see him. I was like, hey, I like, yeah, haven't yeah. seen you in a year. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, we were able to open on November 8th of 2021 and then November 8th of 2022. So that was pretty cool. Like the power of one year, the growth that could happen, crazy. the excitement. We gave out 166 sandwiches in uh, two and a half hours at the grand opening. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was it was just a great celebration. And now that one's up and running, and we're still working on exposing ourselves to all the people in, in South Pasadena. And uh, we've been going out and giving away BOGO cards. We make about like 50 to 70 uh, mini sandwiches that one of our co-owners goes out and gives out to all the businesses. And then we're just you know selling yeah. smiles in St. Pete. Selling smiles in St. Pete. I think one thing that stood out to me there was how you want to try to have your second location um, – be you un- like fit in with the unique kind of area. It mm-hmm. reminds me of something that like Trader Joe's tries to do, right? Like people get excited when they yep. hear about a Trader Joe's opening up in their area. Oh, my area. girlfriend was yeah, was pumped. <laughs> Whatever. And the stores all kind of reflect the local community. They don't try to you know force their brand super hard on like your area. They're like, well, what's you know what's what do a, we need? What's yeah. the St. Pete vibe here? Let's bring in that those colors. Let's bro- build murals for you know to represent this community that we're a part of it yep. and. Um, I think that's rad that you're doing that. My last question on this segment is, was there anything that you learned from your first location that you were like, oh, I want to do this a little bit differently this time? Yeah, so like simplest um, is that we have a drink like display fridge. Mm-hmm. And at the first one, everyone just overlooks it because immediately they come in and they're like, order here, sandwiches. They're just, it's a lot to take in because there's a lot of options. Um, and then they get to the checkout. They're like, oh, I'll take a drink. And it's like, yeah, it's at the display fridge. And then it's all the way at the back front. So at the second location, we built this display fridge into the line itself. Mm. So it's not like off into a corner or anything. Like you literally have to walk by it. So it just takes like, you know, a little bit of those questions away. And plus our customers aren't doubling back and moving back and forth. Um, So we learned structurally that way. The second shot's more of a hamburger. The first shot's a hot dog. So it just (laughs) is different um, with the layout. We were able to like bring in a little bit more of a artistic flair to the area with Japanese uh, charred wood for our coffee section with a Breaking Bad Gateway Subs mural because we do all of our Kyoto drips for cold brew. That's so cool. And we roast our own coffee. (laughs) And at the other one, we have like a lighter beach wood. Um, So, and then the floor is all speckled blue and white. Nice. So it kind of reminds you a little bit, like you are at the beach. Like if someone walks in barefoot, I'm not saying anything. Yep. You know, and it's so it's just it's cool. That's rad, man. That see, this is how you build good vibes. Let's move on into the second section of the podcast: social faux pas that make people really uncomfortable. I want to focus on these unintentional social mistakes that you and I were goofing around with when we were like. You know, preparing for this episode, these are things that can make 
not just customers, people uncomfortable. So I found a YouTube video where the guys from Charisma on Command provide a bunch of examples. Let's pull up the first one, which is called question cutting. Another common way people hog the conversational spotlight, question cutting, asking a question and then interrupting the answer. Talking over each other is commonplace in a group of excited friends, and it isn't always a bad thing. But if you interrupt right after you ask a question, it's almost always frustrating. Let's say it goes how you think it's gonna go. Khabib dominates. What's next? I'll tell you I, what I, I think. Go ahead. And I, one of the reasons I, I say this is because I heard you say this, yeah. so I put a lot of weight into it, is he's done. Okay, so yes and no. I think he retires. I don't think a Tony Ferguson, I don't think a <laughs> Connor fight. And so you go out to walk the dog? This one is Jimmy Fallon keeps cutting off his guest. We don't have to watch. It's the same idea. Um, let's go into, I want to watch all three of these, and then you and I can kind of pick them apart and talk about how your employees don't do these things and just your reactions to them. Now let's talk about a mistake that often comes with good intentions, giving unsolicited advice. As an example, watch George from Impulsive give the Island Boys financial advice for if their music career flames out. I think if God forbid it doesn't go in your guys' direction, for real, oh. I think you guys take all of your jewelry assets and invest it in something. So you guys <laughs> will never ever be broke again. So I don't think there's ever gonna be a broke situation, but I'm saying like, if you guys- George isn't a rude guy. He's genuinely trying to be helpful here, but you can see it makes the Island Boys angry because they didn't ask what to do if their music career doesn't work. So the advice feels insulting. George, stop talking. We have multiple- <laughs> Wait, that oh. was- yeah. Hey, that was, got, that was nah, for you doing. guys. Yeah, you, you That know, wasn't like a hate I don't, shot. I don't need, I don't yeah. need financial yeah, advice when I probably make more money than you. you. But that was me being nice. It wasn't okay. me being like an asshole. Because I was giving you guys nice advice and you guys were being assholes. Hey, George, keep cool. talking. Don't walk out. This last one is instant aggression. The last mistake we'll cover today is instant aggression. It's okay to stand up for yourself and draw boundaries, but some people respond to the slightest accidental offense with way too much hostility. Here's a great example of this from a first date. How old do you think I am? Um, maybe with 29. 30? I don't know. Now notice how she responds. Did you say 29? Did you say 30? I'm actually about to choke because of you. I'm 25. You can see her continued hostility makes the guy very uncomfortable. I didn't know. You said I'm 29 or I'm 30. You don't seem like a 25 year old. I am 25. I am not 29 or 30, okay? Often this instant aggression comes from assuming negative intent where there isn't any. You're much better off assuming someone's being positive until they explicitly prove otherwise. Social faux pas. There's three of them there. Question cutting, giving unsolicited advice, instant aggression. There were lots of other ones from this video that I didn't share um, because it was a doozy. I thought these three made the most sense. Do these resonate with you? What, what's your reaction? Uh, definitely. I would say like these are just good for everyday life. Like, at the end of the day, one thing with the restaurant industry and like us in particular, it's like we're not going to your table and serving you. So it's less of a full on interaction and conversation where it's more of a hey, hello, like a very good uh, greeting. And then, uh, you know, asking questions. And then, like, uh, we're pretty simple. So this doesn't run into an issue all that often. Um, I would say the more solicited advice sometimes we're like, we do see ourselves as professionals. So sometimes we're like, yeah, you could do it this way, but are you sure you want to do it this way <laughs> type of thing? And then it's like, they say, yes, it's like, okay, like you're the boss. And, um, but it, it ends there. But for the, uh, question cutting and things like that, that for me, it, it more stems from someone wanting to hear themselves speak and thinking about the next thing that this individual is saying, or the next thing that I'm going to say rather than what this individual re is saying and responding to it. Um, and I could see that, like, that definitely gets into an issue when you're dealing with your employees in particular because they all have concerns. There's, yeah, there's countless of things that occur. And if they don't feel like they're actually being heard, whether it's a disgruntledness with another employee, a disgruntledness with a customer, like if you don't take the time to shut up and just kind of be like, hey, like I hear you, mm -hmm. and then respond honestly, like I might not have, I might not have a solution for you right now. Like it's something that we could work together because the real world is complicated and there's no just cookie cutter solution to anything. So then what I'll try to end up doing is just taking and also we're very biased individuals, like we're the center of all of our own little worlds. So then all of a sudden, like 
stories, the same story could be told drastically different seven different ways. So what I'll try to do with the ask, like asking questions is, you know, here's a scenario. I'll talk to everyone involved, get snippets of each, not react to any one of them. Just absorb it and be like, I hear you. Okay, like we'll get back to you. And then make an educated decision objectively rather than based off of someone individuals, some individual's emotion. So that sounds like that is when there's maybe some, whether it's conflict or just challenges mm. amongst like employees on a team. Have you heard about your team having to handle any uncomfortable situations inside your store where they like maybe did a really good job? Yeah, like we tell everyone like, my team does a really good job at not reacting, more so with the burst of angry video where it's like a customer will come in and like we've had some just like silly things like customers bringing in like nudity and this and that and like trying to give it to us during the lunch rush and being like, what are you doing? You know, and it started with like, like simple comics or simple this and that. And then it turns like once customers get comfortable, it can take a, and we try to make everyone feel really comfortable. Like we've generally, That's what we're about yeah, today. we generally want to be friends with all of our customers. And with some customers, it's just like defining that line, right? And then when they go over it, like helping them tailor it back. Like, hey, this is a PG place. This is a place that like we try to work. Like we want families to come in and feel. We want everyone to feel comfortable. Yeah. Right. And then, so like going back to like one of my models is whatever makes you happy makes me happy as long as your happiness doesn't impede on mine. And so it's like that teetering point where it's like, hey, if you just want to bring comics in and you want some of the employees to read it, no big deal. If you're going to start bringing in some like explicit stuff and then also start treating our employees a certain way, it's like then we have problems. Yeah. So like we've had issues with that. And thankfully, like our employees know like essentially smile and wave boys type scenario. And then like internally let's discuss it and come up with a better game plan of how to address it mm -hmm. so it's not just us blowing up in front of all of our other customers and then not knowing the full extent of the story you know we've had uh <coughs> when we first opened we had a gentleman named uncle diaz who was a homeless guy and we would you know we'd do pretty well to feed the homeless but then it would sometimes get overbearing where he would make customers feel uncomfortable, things like that. Hmm. And like we had to step in a handful of times and and uh, and just deal with it. And then he would come in greatly intoxicated. And then that brings in like a whole threat to like our employees and things like that. So it's like, hey, like this is how you have to play the game. We have no problem giving you a free sandwich here and there and doing stuff like that because we get it. Everyone needs something However, once you start like imposing on my customer's happiness, like we got to cut that cord. Yeah. And then sometimes it's better to get rid of one bad apple and like cut that off early than to let the whole batch suffer. Yeah. Um, and then just acquiring enough information and making an objective decision. That's a great example. And it sounds like you handled it pretty well. What about teaching moments when maybe one of your employees makes a mistake or they don't handle a customer situation really well? Can you share some stories of like how you've learned along the way as like a leader and an owner mm -hmm. of how to gently have good teaching moments that have a good outcome for everyone? Yeah, there's, and this is another thing, it's like even me, even my managers, even our co-owners, like we can't be everywhere at once, mm -hmm. right? So then it's, uh, I think the best teaching moment we have is we don't, we don't jump to conclusions. Like we've had customers complain about our employees and things like that. And like some employees would be like, you know, off with the employee or off with the customer, like immediately. And instead it was kind of like, let's get together and let's talk about our problems. And if we can come up with a, a cordial solution, let's do it. But regardless, like something has to give. Yeah. Um, so situations like that, I think we've handled pretty well. I don't, there's rarely a situation where it's like I hear something and it's just blatantly like, like what the heck was that? Like yeah. we did have, um, we had a situation with an employee who's no longer with us, um, so I'm not going to mention names or anything, but he 
has been smoking cigarettes for the past 20 years and like we're all addicted to plethora of things whether it's technology coffee whatever you know like we all have our problems so going back to like viewing that person like loving the individual hating the action Mm -hmm. like he got to the point after like at the end of a eight hour shift that he was asking customers for cigarettes and stuff like that and i was like and like all my other employees are like what the heck's going on like doesn't know (laughs) what to do and stuff like that so and this was just you know a short-term solution but hey I sat him down, I talked to him, I was like, how do you like your job? Like, just inquiring, this and that. And then I was basically like, here's a nicotine stick. Do not ask my customers for cigarettes. I get it. We all have things that we've been addicted to. You know, this should cover that, at least for the short term. You know, smoke it out back. Don't let anyone see you. Hitting all the metrics. But I was like, like, you need to be nicer. Because we all, like, if, if you take away my coffee... I'm not going to be the same nice old cheery Grant <laughs> that I would if, like, I had the coffee. For sure. You know, so it's just seeing people in that and being like, hey, like, like we're down to work with you, mm-hmm. but we need to see some change in momentum and movement. You mentioned when we were prepping for this interview about how sometimes you'll go on walks with your employees or, like, mm-hmm. just take them aside and just be like, hey, let's go hang out for a little bit. Like, yeah. you know, a no-pressure situation. I want to hear about what's going on with you. What was the impetus for that, like? You just decided one day you're going to start doing that? Or oh, no, where'd this that come was, from? Like, and it's something that over the past year with just trials and tribulations and also being in my own state of just like hurtness from losing my brother and stuff mm-hmm. like that, I haven't been able to do it as much because when you're in a period of fear, mm-hmm. you're not necessarily as open to going and like extracting problems. Yeah. Right? It's like when I, like the past year, I was like, I got enough problems. Like, I don't want, I don't want any more problems. Right. So then that whole portion of it stopped. And now that like it's a new year, things are developing, time has a tendency to heal things. Um, and it opens up to like, like if you're not taking your key employees and key, like a company is only as good as the people you fill it with. You know, so if you're not taking them for walks, finding out the actual pulse of things, it's the whole idea of like, here's a scenario, here's a bunch of different like perceptives on the same scenario. The only way you get to an objective truth is by taking enough information in, not giving emotion to it, and then just sitting with it. And the only way you get to do that is like, here's a two hour period, whether it's a lunch, whether it's a walk in the park, whether it's, you know, you name it. And without those things to occur, you don't actually get information. Like humans, as far as a conversation oriented, like for you to go deep, like most, like I would say 85% of our conversations, 90% arbitrary number, don't quote me on it, Mm -hmm. is just a surface level conversation. For sure. Right. And until you can get deep and then sit sit with someone and be like, hey, like your body language changed a little bit on that portion. What's there? Yeah. You know, because there's a reason and then there's a real reason to everything. Mm-hmm. And people have a way to hide, especially if they have fear or if they just don't know how you're going to be responsive. Like, and the only way, especially with like the world, the way the world that sees like bosses, they have a tendency to just be like, I need to hate my boss. But in reality, it's like, like I'm trying to do a lot to like make my employee's life as easy as possible and to work with them. And then also to still keep a company, right? There's just, there's gives and flows. It's like, you can't, sacrifice the 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 chicken for the egg and uh, so it's just it's and then they get to see my perception like perceptive perception they get to see like my viewpoint yeah right because it's like most of the time i'm not trying to like be mean but there's objectives there's things that we need to do to stay in business and if we don't accomplish them and if we don't get everyone on board then it's just not going to happen it sounds like you are practicing empathy, but then also modeling empathy for them as well, for them mm. to be able to try to empathize with you as a small business owner. Yeah. And like, we're like, I started this at 23. Yeah. Right. Like that's like, you know, and I started thinking about this at 18. <laughs> so it's like, I thought about it for five years without ever actually coming over and putting it into fruition. And in the end of the day, a lot of the people I work with are relatively my age, you know, or they were the age that I started this whole process in. So, like, I get it. Like, I understand, like, what they're going through a lot of the times. And it's, uh, like, I, I want a team. You know, I want everyone rowing in the same direction. And if, like, they're, you know, I just, I want a team. This leads me nicely into our last section, which is how to best build rapport with your teammates. <laughs> feel like we've talked about some of the questions I'm already 
I've written down, but it is honestly like so awesome how polite, fast, and professional the folks that work at Gateway are. It's one of the reasons I choose Gateway over any other sandwich mm-hmm. shop I could go to. Don't get me started on pub subs. Oh, they're fine. They're overrated and hyped, in my opinion. You don't have to say it. It's okay. Um, but gosh, a lot of times, just for whatever reason, I always get like not the most um, polite, fast, or professional yeah. sub maker or sandwich makers at Publix. Um, but the energy is contagious at Gateway. You walk in, it's just like an assembly line with like attention to detail, speed. And most times I've been in the store, like you're back there too, Mm -hmm. like bumping elbows with everybody, slinging Sammy's arm in arm with your employees. Um, How do you get people to stay at a restaurant for a long time? I think that you could like broaden that question to like outside of just restaurant, like how do you get someone to stay? Period. Yeah, retention. Yeah, if you think about quiet quitting and everything that's been going on over the past two years with like everyone, like it doesn't matter, like it's people want to work for someone that they feel like they can grow with and be an invested in. Yeah. You know, and like we've proven that we can grow. Like in one year we have two shops, right? And also that like the management does care. Like to your point, like I do, like I like my job. Like I planned my job to be almost in Zen flow. Like we're like, okay, there's a lot of headaches to the restaurant industry, but if if the art of a true master is making something very complex look simple Mm -hmm. and we like describe like we're duck on water, like we're frantically moving everything, but we're like very calm and poised that we're putting on a show. And as long as everyone in the, in the group, like when you have a lunch where everyone's a veteran and there's like, not necessarily like in the newbies, it's just, it takes more time, right? They're learning. It's just a process of 10,000 hours to like learn how to make a damn sandwich really good. (laughs) And um, when everyone's in flow and communication's like awesome, like two hours go by like that, everyone's happy, there's smiles, it just feels like the act of presentness. You know, if you're living in the past, you have depression. If you're living in the future, you have anxiety. And God, the universe persists in the present. And for me, if I have all my other stuff taken care of, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than on the line giving a smile. Like that's literally like all it is. Um, it comes obviously like when I got all this other noise that extracts me from it, that then my shifts aren't as like beautiful, so to speak. And uh, so people like we like we hire new people and they're like, this job is easy. It's like, yeah, it's easy because we do all the little things right. Mm. And it doesn't get easy on the managers. It makes our jobs way harder, all this other stuff when we don't do all the little things right. Um, And for me, like leadership, like I am young, you know, like people have a tendency to view me as their equal and not even in the company and and that's okay. Like it's just walking that fine line as well because I am like, I'm I'm a team member. Like I love doing dishes. I love taking out the trash. I got no problem doing it. Um, Up until the last two weeks when we finally been able to onboard enough people and be confident in the team, like I was working 30 to 40 to 50 hours plus working on the business another 20, 30 hours. And I did that for like seven months. And uh, thankfully I don't have to anymore because I was getting really burnt out about Christmas and, and, you know, there's blitz periods and things like that and it'll come again. But now like, you know, I'm helping out at each shop during lunch, bouncing back and forth. I'm taking catering orders and I'm working one shift this week in the shop. And I've, been able to scale a little bit. Our managers' lives are getting a little easier as we were able to bring in better talent. And then that allows me to focus on the business, which is the marketing, the cultural, the doing things like this, the getting our gateway voice out. Yep. Um, and then also just focusing on where's next. Right? I view myself as a CVO, chief vision officer, and my job is to be looking over the horizon and what's coming. You know, there's a looming recession, like according to all the financial and all the tech people and everything else. So it's how are we going to adapt within that? Yeah. I think that well, the question I had here is not going to pertain anymore, but I want to know, like, you've worked in restaurants. You mentioned it briefly earlier where you're like, there is no back of house. There is no front of house. But, like, final thoughts on, like, how to retain people and how to build just, like, a better culture. Mm -hmm. Um, When you and I were prepping for this episode, I told you how I've worked as a pizza delivery boy. I've worked as an Uber driver. I've worked as a bus boy. 
and there was always a lot of tension between me and like back of house folks. Yep. And I tried to tread carefully, but it, it seemed like it was built into the structure. The, yeah. What are some of your thoughts on like, so, yeah, like so like figuring out retention mm-hmm. at, at, at Gateway? Yeah. Um, when I worked at a pizzeria, like I was a kitchen boy and then all of a sudden everyone else quit and I became head chef within like a month of being there and had to like figure it all out. Plus, so I remembered using myself as like a, an experiment, so to spe- say, where I was like, how do I feel? Like my whole like, cause I was planning this since 18, my whole few years of taking these jobs, like I have a finance degree from the norm- number four finance school in the nation, had like 50% scholarship, a lot of great opportunities. And then I put myself through like an experiment of like, what does it feel like to be this person? Right. So then when I get an opportunity to build what I'm trying to build, I have empathy, I have viewpoint, I have perspective because I did go through and put in the few months of living it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found at the pizzeria was that there was a divide between the front of house who wanted it to be as busy as possible because their whole pay comes from tips. And the back of house who wanted it to be as slow as possible because no matter if no one came in or someone came in, it was 10 bucks an hour, you know. So there was this whole energy uh, split that you couldn't get everyone rowing in the same direction. And, yeah, I, it wasn't my job to like come up with a solution for that, but it was my job to plan for my future. Yeah. And so I went through that, and I was like, that was so interesting. Just kept it along in my backpack with me, and then went and did a six-month apprenticeship in coffee as a barista, and there it was all one, you know, I would run a shift with two or three people and that was it. And then I saw also just with uh, the new POS systems and the way that the, the, the whole system was evolving was that I was making decent money. You know, customers, when we were extra happy, extra on our shit, just taking care of business, yeah. they felt like they would tip more because their experience was better than anywhere else. You know, so then I took that with us. So it's the whole aspect of, you know, we take a customer, we greet them, we try to give them the best experience possible, we'll give them free chips on their first time, we do punch cards, we do a award program, we get them to the end, and then you know they had such a great experience that they go ahead and tip us. You, know, you get a lot of hands making it easy to tip, and we only have four employees that will work there in a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, four is an overlap for lunch, and that money just goes right back into our employees' pockets. So then all of a sudden we're able to pay way more than we would be able to do because of our customers helping out and carrying that load. And then therefore our employees are able to hit their basic needs, stay happy, be like enjoy the culture, want to be here, want to see it grow. And we're able to retain them because of our employee or our uh, customers helping us with, with pay. Final thoughts you want to put out into the world for <laughs> Gateway Subs on – the Customer Engagement Lab podcast. Um, I don't know. Like, it's only been a year and a half now. Mm-hmm. Like, less, to be honest with you, since, like, actually opening. A long time since coming along. And it's just, it's really cool to see a dream that I spent thousands of hours moseying over and playing with in my mind coming to fruition and coming to fruition with relative accuracy. And that's been really beautiful to see because it's like if you sit down and you put a, a lot of thought into something, like you can go and do anything in this world. You know, I always thought I was going to be an MSNBC talking stocks, hitting, you know, the dinger at the end of the bell and <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, my motto originally was like, <clears throat> go to the money and your heart will follow. And I wasn't very happy living my life like that for four or five years. And then I got to like college and I was like, you know, fuck that. Like I'm making build relationships make friends focus on that stuff and i got so much more value uh than just the grind and it also is like i was able to do more with less because i had a lot of hands and uh yeah just kind of like anything that you want to do if you really want to do it and you spend enough time thinking about it and you burn your boats you could go do that you can pull a a grant strayer Get a flip phone, get rid of your iPhone, oh, yeah. meditate every morning at 5 a.m. for six months. Yeah, like I built this whole thing five months, lived on a flip phone, and didn't even get a real phone back until my brother passed away yeah. because I needed to be able to talk to people on a more regular basis. And that's like, that's 
the little detail of this whole thing that's crazy. I had 180 minutes that I would go to Target and buy like the <laughs> Metro $20 pack. And then I had my iPod, an iPhone that broke that became my iPod. So I would call people on my email and I used my <laughs> flip phone as a pager and a buzzer to talk to the GC, the architect, the real estate agent. And then I would just, yeah, like, let me find Wi-Fi. I'll call you back. No distractions. Totally focused. Totally focused. It was crazy. I I miss that. (laughs) (laughs) I miss it. Um, Thanks so much, Grant, for coming on. I feel like I've got a really cool friend and mentor now. If I ever want to start a business, um, people can reach you at gatewaysubs.com. Yeah, so gatewaysubs.com. Also through our email, uh, gatewaysubs at gmail.com. Um, gatewaysubs.com is going to have the most up to date. We are in the process of making a website change. We're this year was all brick and mortar infrastructure previous year. And this upcoming year is all online presence, uh, catering organization, responsiveness, and just like evolving in that realm. And next time any of my listeners uh, come to Tampa Bay, Florida, and they want to get a really good sandwich, they want a good lunch, fresh food, Mm -hmm. they want that meat kind of overlapped on top and tucked in nice and neat, go check out Gateway Subs. Grant, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, Travis. All right. You can catch us on the Customer Engagement Lab. A couple weeks, we'll have another new episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to the Customer Engagement Lab brought to you by PandaDoc. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or connect with us on LinkedIn. We love to hear from you and what you think of the show.